All right. Well, how's everybody doing this morning? Happy Father's Day to you fathers out there. Hopefully you're getting some good barbecue today, some loving from your kids. My name's George. I'm the pastor here at The Gathering. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, or if you're watching this later online, God bless you. It's great to see you this morning. We're going through uh, a series on worldview, and we're looking at how we view life and how that impacts how we navigate our way through life. So uh, today, as part of that worldview series, I want to ask you a question. And that's what comes to mind when you think about your rights. What comes to mind? What do you think when you think about your rights? Uh, what do you think about? What comes to mind? What are some of the things that come to mind? Constitution, voting, voting rights, liberty, freedom, happiness. <laughs> right? And those are kind of the, the things we think about, right? What are our God-given rights, right? And we, most people you talk about, you, they'll, they'll say life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And where does that come from? Uh, declaration of Independence, actually, right? It's our declaration of war against England. That's where we get that statement from. Uh, that we're, gonna, we're done with the king and we have certain rights and that justifies us declaring war against the, the king that was governing, right? Uh, a lot of people all think of, also think about the Bill of Rights, right? This idea of I have the right to assembly and free speech was basically the right to, to protest uh, your government, the right to keep and bear arms, which would be the right to protect yourself and your property, uh, the right to privacy, nobody can be in your business, right? We think of those as being our, our God-given rights. Uh, what about civil and human rights? Well, that's a big conversation today. What are our civil and human rights, right? Racial rights, gender rights, reproductive rights is now front and center with uh, the leaked Supreme Court uh, pending decision on Roe v. Wade. Uh, what about the right to health care, welfare, free education, right? All, a lot of people think these are, are God-given inalienable rights. Uh, and anybody know what that word inalienable means? Right? It doesn't mean they didn't come from aliens, right? That's not that's what I thought as a kid, right? They didn't come from aliens. Uh, it means that you, they can't be taken away, that an inalienable right is something that no one can take away from you because it's God-given, right? And if God gives you something, people can't take it from you because God's greater than all people. So today I want to, the kind of the, the theme of our worldview study is this idea of reimagining life, not from a cultural or social worldview, but reimagining it from a biblical, godly worldview. And I want to think about, we've used this analogy every week, right, this idea of worldview and driver assist technology. I told the story of renting a car recently that had this, all this crazy technology that wouldn't let me change lanes if I didn't signal and uh, all this really annoying stuff because I don't typically signal, uh, just true confession. <laughs> I see it as a service to other people to not provoke them to want to cut me off, right? So it's my way of pastoring community by not signaling. Not really, uh, right? It's a, but all this technology is designed to get you to your desired destination and keep you in the lane that safely gets you there most effectively. And that's kind of what a worldview is. It's a series of core beliefs that we use to navigate life that keep us in a certain lane and deliver us to our desired destination. And those core, view, those core beliefs start with what you believe is real. What's at the center of your reality? From that, we decide what's true. So depending on your view of reality, if you believe that everything evolved, that's going to lead to different truths than if you believe that God created everything. That's going to lead to different truths, right? From what's true, then we decide what the highest good is. And we've talked about this, how if we believe that God created us in His image, that's the truth, and the ultimate good is to be like Him, right? To reflect the image we were designed and created to reflect. If we evolve, and then truth is a very relative thing, and the greatest good is my survival, survival of the fittest, and I should then from that good, we decide what we want out of life right? And if I desire to be like God, then 
I want to do the things that Jesus does. That's what I desire. I want to be Christ-like because he is the ultimate image of God. If everything evolved, then I just want to be happy. I just want to have a peaceful, happy life and what's good for me. And then from what we decide is we want out of life, that's the choices that we make. And the choices we make uh, ultimately determine what we collect along the way. All right, and so this is kind of the, and it's a lot of information if you're first time visiting with us. Hopefully this is starting to sink in week after week, and you start to see this is how our worldview shapes not only the decisions we make, but what we collect in life. Okay, so those worldviews put you in one of two lanes. So your worldview has really puts you in one of two lanes. One's a biblical lane. The other is a secular lane. If you have a biblical worldview, it's designed to keep you in a biblical way of living. If you have a secular worldview, that's designed to keep you in a secular worldly lane. This makes sense? That's why it's so important to look at and understand what is your worldview because that's keeping you in a particular lane, and depending on which lane you're in, there's only two, de two destinations according to the Bible. One's life, and Jesus says that's a very narrow lane. Very few people actually choose to stay in a biblical lane that leads to life. The majority of people take the broad, easy road that leads to destruction. That's at a broad lane. There's lots of them. It's a full freeway, multi-lanes. Uh, it's probably got an express lane if you want. Uh, that's going to take you very quickly to destruction. And so that's why it's so important to understand what our worldview is and what direction is it taking me in life uh, because I don't know about you, but I want to end up at eternal life. I don't want to end up at destruction. Anybody? No? Nobody wants destruction? All right, okay. Uh, <laughs> all right, so great. So we're all, we're all on the same page. So let's look at what the Bible says about our rights, and let's look this morning if our view on our rights has us in a biblical lane or a secular lane. Can we do that? All right, let me pray for us. I feel like this, is, this could, uh, you could get a little riled up this morning, and I'm, it's not my intention. My intention is to get us on a lane towards life. So, Father, we pray that this morning your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts, that you would reveal to us the truth of your word. We know that the, the natural person can't understand the things of the Spirit because they're spiritually discerned. So we need your Holy Spirit to reveal the truth of your word to us today so that it'll change our life. And we trust you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so our text this morning is going to come out of John chapter 1. I'm going to read John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, then jump to verses 9 through 14. All right, so John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and then 9 through 14. If you want to turn in your phone or you can just read it here up on the screen. Uh, this is the NIV version, if you're curious. It says, in the beginning was the Word. Say Word. word. You can tell I used to work at the Rock. <laughs> All right? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jumping to verse 9. It says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and, the, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. All right, so I've got some, uh, some basics, I think three uh, key points, and then we'll get into some application. 
Uh, the first big idea today is that Jesus is God expressing or revealing himself. Jesus is God expressing or revealing himself. When it says he was the word, that word in the Greek is the Greek word logos. And the word logos means an idea fully conceived and fully expressed. So I want you to think about this. The Bible saying that Jesus is God fully conceived, fully aware of all that God is, and then expressing all that he is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, in a way that can be understood. It's a revelation, right? So Jesus is expressing, is God expressing himself fully? Uh, as God, he expresses himself to us in three distinct ways. Jesus expresses himself to us in three distinct ways. The first one we see in this text is that he expresses himself in relationship to the Father and Spirit. It starts with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, right? So it's saying that Jesus was with God. He is a relational God, and this is what it shows us. He is a personal, loving relational God. He's not just a power. He's not a force. Uh, sorry, Star Wars fans. It's not just a force be with you. It's God be with you, right? Jesus be with you. The Spirit be with you. Jesus is revealing that he's relationally wants to have that personal, loving, intimate relationship with us, right? So this is critical to our worldview, how you view God. Do you see God as relational, as loving, as wanting to be in relationship or do you see him as a cop that just wants to bust you, right? A lot of people, that's how they view God, just CHP sitting on the side of the road of life waiting to catch you speeding, right? That's not God. God is a loving, personal, relating God, and he wants to be in a relationship with us. Second way that God, Jesus reveals God to us is through the creation of the world. So first is in relation to the Father. Second is in the creation of the of the world. In Romans 1, it says that the, that which may be known about God, even his invisible attributes and divine nature has, can be known being clearly seen through what has been made. Now, when you think about this, how did Jesus create? If you go back to Genesis 1, in the beginning, he spoke. Now, when you think about this, God could create in any way he, can, he wants, right? He's all-powerful, which means he, can, he could just model it and not say anything. He could just think it, and it would be, right? He could just, in his own mind, think, let there be, and it would just be. When you're all-powerful, you don't have to do it one particular way. God could choose to create in any way he wanted. He chose to create through speaking so that we would know what he's doing and why. Creation is a revelation. This is important, and this is why uh, making sure that you have that biblical worldview that God created everything is so fundamental to life. If you believe that everything just evolved, then it is no re there is no revelation for you. You are in the dark. Whatever makes sense to you it would be valid because there is no objective truth. This makes sense? Right? Creation is a revelation. You, you look at the human body, you look at atoms, you look at DNA. All of it is revealing things about God. In particular, it's revealing His perfection. Everything God makes is perfect. Right? It reveals his purposefulness. When he names everything, gives everything a purpose and a function, it, then it, and that he's all-powerful and that he can just speak everything in, into existence. The third way Jesus reveals God to us is by his incarnation. So it's, it's, it's his relation to the Father, his creation of the world, and it's his incarnation as a man. Jesus actually comes and shows us that God is humble. He's compassionate. He's a sacrificial Savior. We wouldn't know any of those things about God if Jesus hadn't come and lived like one of us. 
Can you imagine the humility it must take? You create everything and you go be born as a baby, dependent on a mother, subject to teachers and having to work for a living. Can you imagine how tempting that, I mean, I, I don't know if it was you, if it was me sitting there as a carpenter at the workbench, right? We're building a, a loft bed for Jackson and I don't know if you guys have ever done this. I'm making two sides for a, a, where I'm routing out uh, sections of a wood to drop in a, a, a wood slab so it's all flush mount, and I made them identical. Any woodworkers out there, you realize, oh, they've got to be opposite. And so I do all this work, and I go to set up. I'm like, ah, right? Because I'm falling. I'm not perfect. Imagine, and I'm like, if I was Jesus, I would just say, let there be. All right, on the table. No one's looking, right? <laughs> you imagine how tempting it would have been for Jesus just to take that power and use it? But no, he shows us his humility, that he is perfectly humble, that he's compassionate. Every time Jesus saw someone that was suffering or broken uh, or abused, it says he was moved in his gut with compassion for them. How is your view of God? Do you see him as off in the, the distance, disconnected from you and your hurts and your struggles? Or do you see him as a God that feels your pain with you? Jesus reveals things to us about God that we would never know if he hadn't become a man. If God wasn't humble enough to become a man, we wouldn't know 90% of what we know about God. Jesus showed us what God's like in human form, right? So Jesus' life is this revelation. It enlightens us. He shows us the meaning of life, right? He, he shows us, come on, here we go. He enlightens us about life. It says, in him, Jesus was life, the, the true meaning of existence. And it says that that life is the light of all mankind, that the way Jesus lived is what shows us, enlightens us to the truth about life. This is critical. There is no other light that will enlighten you as to the meaning and manner and purpose of life than the life of Jesus Christ. If you are modeling your life on anything else, you are in the dark. Jesus is, his life is the light for all mankind. This make sense? If, and if that's not your worldview, then realize you're abandoning that light to stumble around in the darkness. We just went on a, a trip recently, uh, Nan and I, a little short cruise to celebrate our 30th wedding anniversary. And I don't know about you, but I'm a, I'm a horrible at unpacking. I just leave it in the suitcase until Nan's so tired of it sitting in the bedroom. She does the laundry for me, right? Uh, I'm just like, giving you all my dirty laundry today, literally. Uh, but, uh, so I set the suitcase there at the base of the bed. And how about you? You ever get up in the middle of the night and you're used to your room being a certain way and you forget that, oh, I left the suitcase there, right? And so I'm walking in the dark and it's like, and then stepping, and I'm, right? That's what life is like if you aren't looking to Jesus for the model for how to live. You're just stumbling over stuff constantly. Right? We're stumbling in our relationships. We're stumbling in our finances. We're stumbling uh, in our emotional life because we're not looking to Jesus to give us light, to enlighten us about the truth of how we should live. And this is challenging, isn't it? Because he lived a pretty radical life, comparatively. You compare it to culture, Jesus' life is not the broad way, is it? It's not the way the majority of people are living. Right? Remember that, that slide about the two roads in the scripture there where it says, broad is the road and many take that path and it leads to destruction so here's the idea jesus his life is a roadmap of the narrow road 
his motives, his agenda, his mission, the way he interacted with people, the way he talked, the way he served, the way he gave of himself. Those are all models for us about what it means to live real life. Okay? He revealed the meaning, the way that life that God meant it to be lived. John 17, 3, now this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. This is the only way of life. And, and when Jesus says stuff like, I am what? The way, the truth, and the life, what's he saying? I'm your worldview. I'm your worldview. That's what that means. I'm your way, I'm the way you're supposed to live life, I'm the truth that you base life on, and I am the source of your very life. Without me, you don't have it, all right? Now, unfortunately, not everyone wants to see the light. Look what Jesus says in John 3. This is the verdict. Light, him, his life, light has come into the world, but people loved darkness. It's not that they don't have the light, it's that they don't want the light. They want darkness. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for the fear that their deeds will be exposed. This is why people take the wide road. Because they love their pornography, they love their greed and materialism, they love their anger and bitterness, and they don't want to bring that into the light because they fear getting exposed. Now, I don't know about you, I'd rather be exposed than end up at destruction at the end of my life. I'd rather come into the light and say, Jesus, shine the light on everything in my life that isn't matching your life so that I can stay on that narrow road. All right? Whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so it may be plain, plainly seen that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. And this is what, what's interesting, right? Is that, Does God see what you do anyway? Yeah, right? He's the one making the ultimate decisions about eternity. What does it matter if anybody else sees it? Why are we so afraid of other people seeing our junk when they don't make any decisions about where we end up? Right? But we hide it thinking that their opinion and their approval matters more than God's. Jesus gives us the right to become children of God. This is, I look, this is biblically your only God-given right. This is it. You've got one biblically explained God-given right. You've got lots of responsibilities, right? You've got a responsibility to not kill your neighbor, right? You've got a responsibility to, to treat all uh, ethnicities equally, right? We've got responsibilities, but that doesn't give us the right to it. God hasn't given us the right to be treated certain ways. He's given us the responsibility to treat other people certain ways, right? It's a complete paradigm flip, right? And we, the problem is that we often confuse our gov-given rights with our God-given right. This is the problem. A lot of conservative evangelical Christians confuse their gov-given rights with their God-given right. For example, being, well, so being a child of God is our only true God-given right. This is your one inalienable right. This is the one thing no one can take from you. That makes sense? This is the one thing that no one can take from you. Go back to the Declaration of Independence, right? Where, we say, where it says, we hold these truths self-evident that all men are created equal, 
and are endowed with certain endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights among those life liberty and the pursuit of happiness it sounds good doesn't it problem is the bible just doesn't teach it that was thomas jefferson was influenced more by the writings of john locke than he was by the bible Bible says we were created in God's image. It doesn't say we were created equal. In fact, the Bible teaches the exact opposite. It says in the body, there are great inequalities. Some are weaker, some are stronger. Some are richer, some are poorer, right? Some have certain abilities, some have fewer abilities. Some are given five talents, some are given one. There's no equality with God. He doesn't want equality because he wants us to learn to love equally. And it's an important that there are that, that I have to have humility among other people that may be smarter than I am or wealthier than I am. Right? I have to have compassion for those that may be less strong than I am, right? That the, I'm supposed to use my inequalities to love people equally. We're created in God's image. God's kids are promised suffering, trials, and persecution. The Bible doesn't promise you life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It promises you suffering, trials, and persecution. Right? And historically, God's children have been the most deprived of life. They've been the most persecuted. They've been deprived of liberty. Almost all of the apostles were martyred or jailed, often both. What about the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights, the right to assemble, to keep and bear arms, the right to privacy? These are all wonderful God-given, God gov-given rights, but they are not our God-given rights. God didn't give you the right to own a gun. Your government did. Right? And as much, and I own a gun, just so you know, I own a gun, right? I'm all for gun ownership. But I understand that it's a government given right. And since it's government given, what can it be? Government taken. All right? And I can't stand there and say, but it's my God given right, because it's not. It just depends on the will of the people in our particular society. I can't go to a foreign country and say, I've got a God-given right to own a gun because in the majority of the world, their governments don't give them that right. That makes sense? And so all of, and so, and, and, and like I'm trying to help my kids understand as they watch the debates that are on the, the news and in the public square right now over reproductive rights, do you have a God-given right to choose an abortion, to choose your gender, to, to choose your privacy. Do you have a God-given right to any of those things? No. I'm not saying that we should not embrace our government-given rights. I'm all for embracing our government-given rights. But just to realize that's all they are. They're not God-given. You have one God-given right, and what is it? To be a child of God. Would to God that we were even as passionate about our God-given right as we are about our gov-given rights. Would to God we posted as much about our God-given right as we post about our government-given rights. Would to God we'd stand up and ensure that everyone took advantage of their God-given right like we do about our gov-given rights. This is the only thing that can't be taken from you. Romans 8, 37 through 39 says, In all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate me from my constitutional rights in Christ Jesus. No, it doesn't say that. It says from the love of God. That's in Christ Jesus. This is what can't be taken from us. Right? This, this being a child of God guarantees you certain things. Eternal life. 
Being a child of God guarantees you eternal life. No one can take that from you. It guarantees you freedom from sin and judgment, not freedom to do whatever you want. And it guarantees you the pursuit of godliness, not happiness, right? The pursuit of godliness. So, backed up. Sorry about that. All right, so let's stand up for our right to become a child of God. How do we do that? How do we stand up for our right to become a child of God? First thing Jesus tells us is you have to believe in Jesus' name. And that's got some key things, and I just want to give you a few ways of what it means to believe in Jesus' name, right? That it, in John three eighteen it says, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. To believe in Jesus means first and foremost that we believe that Jesus paid the full penalty for our sin on the cross. That's what it means to believe in Jesus' name. It doesn't mean that you believe that Jesus existed. It doesn't mean that you believe that he was a good guy or a good teacher. You believe that he was God's punishment for your sin on the cross and he took the full measure of your sin and all the judgment that was that deserving of your sin he took that on the cross and died in your place was separated from the father so you wouldn't have to be that's the first thing it means to believe in Jesus' name second thing it means is to believe that his acceptance is all that matters look at john I'm going to read John 5, 43 through 44. It says, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you'll accept him. How can you believe since you only accept glory from one another, but do not seek the glory that comes from the Holy God? One of the reasons we don't believe in Jesus truly believe in Jesus is because other people's acceptance and praise is more important to us than God's. And Jesus says, how can you believe when you're seeking the acceptance of other people, when you're seeking the acceptance of your peers and co-workers or family members or parents, if that's what you're seeking, you will seek that over believing in Jesus. Because ex believing that Jesus' acceptance is all that matters leads to the next part. Believing that knowing Him is all that satisfies. So you've got to believe. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Who, who believes in me will never thirst. See, this is a different kind of believing, isn't it? It's not just, hey, do you believe in Jesus? Raise your hand. Let me pray for you. You're all good for eternity. No, this is me believing that if I give my life to Jesus and receive him as my Savior, that that's what's going to satisfy me in my life and for eternity. That he is all I need. He is all I want. So I'm willing to give up everything else to get him. Right? Jesus told a parable about a man who was walking through a field, trips over something, starts looking at it and sees it's a big chest full of buried treasure. And he went and he covered it up quickly, sold everything he had and bought that field. Smart, wouldn't it? Right? Like if you're like, you know, walking through a field in Texas and stepped in some oil, you'd be like, oh, is this for sale? Right? <laughs> Let me buy this really quick, right? And you'd sell everything you have because you realize that the value of owning that thing was far greater than anything else in life. Is Jesus that to you? Do you believe that having Jesus is more valuable than anything else you can have in life and you'd be willing to give up everything in order to have Jesus? 
<laughs> yes, thank you, Brian. Right? Would you give up your family? Would you give up your career? Would you give up your nice home and your lifestyle? Would you give up the approval of other people to have Jesus and have eternal life? Be honest. Ask yourself that question. Or is the approval of other people, status in this world, more important to me? Are my toys and my lifestyle more important to me than having Jesus? This is what your worldview will inform. What do I really want out of life? Do I want Jesus more than anything? And then lastly, believing in Jesus believes you need to come into the light. John 12, 46, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should remain in darkness. Here's the kicker, and I think this is kind of the dividing point where people shift lanes as so-called believers. They want to be forgiven, but they don't want to be in the light. Brian and I talk about this all the time with guys, right? Whenever we have discussion groups, it's like, hey, let's, let's share our struggles, right? You guys have like this little bit of, of light, this little, you know, flicker of light. That I'll, I'll tell this truth. I'm not going to tell this truth. I'm not going to bring that depth into the light, right? I'm going to bring the easy stuff. Yeah, I, I struggle with, I get frustrated sometimes. I speed, right? Uh, they'll, they'll share those kind of things, but they won't share the stuff that really needs to come into the light. Do you believe in Jesus to the point where you realize that you need to bring all of your life into the light? Jesus is light. In him is no darkness at all. You can't believe in Jesus and live your life in the dark. And I know that's not a popular saying, and some of you are probably a little frustrated with me, but I love you and care about you too much to let you be on that road to destruction. Because that kind of thinking that I can live in darkness and call myself a child of the light is a secular worldview. That says there is no God who's keeping me accountable and, those, and the stakes are eternity, All right? That kind of thinking is that thinking that if it's not hurting anyone else, it's okay. That's secular thinking. That's not biblical thinking. If you believe in Jesus, you have to bring your whole life into the light. Are you willing to do that? Do you believe that coming, bringing your life into the light of Jesus is a good thing? Or do you think it's a bad thing? That that'll result in bad things? Or do you realize, no, that'll bring me into satisfaction in Jesus. That'll bring me into acceptance. That'll bring me into forgiveness. Do you believe that coming into the light in Jesus is a good thing? Second thing we need to do to stand up for our right is to receive Jesus for who he truly is. It's not enough simply to believe in Jesus. I love this verse from James 2.19, right? It says, yes, exactly. You believe there is one God, good. Even the demons believe and they shudder. So demons believe in God, but guess what? They are not children of God. Believing in God is not enough. You have to receive the reality of who Jesus is in your life. You've got to receive him as your savior, right? Uh, receive his sacrifice in your place and receiving him as your savior looks like confessing your sin, receiving his forgiveness, bringing that sin into the light. Also, receiving him as your healer. The Bible says, by his wounds, we are healed. Coming to Jesus with your physical, emotional, spiritual infirmities and saying, Jesus, heal me, supernaturally heal me. I don't want to live with this brokenness. I don't want to live with this dysfunction anymore. I don't want to live with this anger, this bitterness, this fear, right? It's not, you know, the world says, oh, you're, you're you know, Irish, you get to be angry, right? You're, you know, you're whatever, you get to be worried. It's not, we don't get to justify those things that aren't godly. 
We're going to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, heal me of my brokenness. Are you tired of brokenness in your life? Are you ready to receive the healing power of Jesus in your life? Next thing, receiving Jesus means we receive him as our sanctifier. Receive him as our sanctifier. 1 John 3, 2 through 3 says that if we, uh, that the children of God, if we have that hope that we're children of God, we will purify ourselves even as he is pure. And so it's not enough to say, I believe in Jesus, I receive forgiveness, but I'm still going to live in, in, in willful disobedience. No, it's saying, Jesus, would you transform my life? You see these areas of sin in my life. Would you take them away once and for all? Would you put me through the furnace, whatever that looks like? Anyone want to go through the furnace today? You should, right? If you believe that Jesus is a sanctifier and it's a good thing to be sanctified, you would say, God, put me through the furnace. Burn up all this dross. Burn up all this wickedness. Burn up all this, this rebellion and, and, and disobedience and, and faithlessness and fear. Burn all this up and burn up my pride. Burn up my lust. Burn up my greed. Use whatever it takes to sanctify me today. Because I don't want to end up in destruction. I want to end up in life. And then lastly, it's receiving him as your coming king. Jesus is coming back, and he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. He is, yeah, you can clap about that. He is coming back, right? That's the real answer to this world mess we're living in, right? I used to, yeah, I remember when I was growing up as a kid going to Horizon, they would say, you know, Maranatha, which means come back, right? There's a whole church named Maranatha. But after a while, as a Christian, you're like, whatever, right? That's our rally cry, whatever, you know? Instead of Maranatha means come, come quickly. It's a cry for Jesus to return. I don't know about you, but I feel that more than ever. I'm like, Lord, come quickly. I'm looking at inflation. I'm like, Jesus, Maranatha, come quickly, <laughs> right? Come quickly. Every time you go to the gas station, say, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come. But see, a, a secular worldview says, next election, come. My presidential campaign, my presidential candidate, come. My favorite legislation, come. We don't see this heart of Jesus. Would you come? Would you set everything right? Would you establish righteousness? Let it rain on the earth. Let it flood. Let it cover the earth. You know, baptism is the first way that we really express that we believe and receive Jesus. And we're going to do a baptism today after church. I think we got six or seven people being baptized today. And baptism simply means, the word baptized simply means to immerse into. And when you are getting baptized, you're being immersed. You're saying, I'm immersed fully into the death and resurrection of Jesus. I'm fully immersed in his salvation. I'm fully immersed in his healing. I'm going to receive that, right? I'm fully immersed in sanctification, that as I come up out of the water, I want to start living a, a whole new life, fully immersed in submission and expectation of Jesus as my coming king. That's what it means to get baptized, and we're going to celebrate that in just a moment. I want to give you a, just a quick recap, all right? Just a quick worldview recap. The biblical lane versus the secular lane. The secular lane says there is no God, so truth is relative. So what's good is choose your own truth, desired, become whatever you want to become. You can be whatever you want to be. What's chosen is to believe in yourself. Anybody ever hear that? Believe in yourself. I realize that is not a biblical worldview. Believe in yourself and receive all the success that you deserve. Biblical way says Jesus is God expressing himself. 
He reveals the truth about God and life. What's good is to see the truth, see the light in Jesus. What's desired is to become a child of God. And what's chosen is to believe in Jesus and receive him fully in your life. Problem is, a lot of Christians change lanes. We're fine with, okay, yeah, Jesus is God expressing himself. I can see that. He reveals the truth about God in life. Okay, sounds good. I'll read my Bible, come to church occasionally. What's good? Oh, I want to choose what's good. I want to choose the truth that works for me. All right, you ever share the truth with someone and you hear that and they say, well, I'm glad that works for you. You ever heard that? Anybody ever heard that? I hear it all the time, right? What does that tell me? What lane are they in? They're a secular lane because truth's relative. So you can have your truth, I'll have my truth because it's all about what works for us because we're trying to become whatever we want. And so we want a truth that helps us be that, all right? And so then you can believe in yourself and receive success. I don't need Jesus, which is what a secular lane says. I don't really need Jesus. I'm not desperate for Jesus. I'll choose Jesus if it works for me, if it gets me into a community where I'm accepted and they serve free lunch every Sunday, right? I'll do that, right? But I'm not desperate for it. Have you changed lanes? Have you drifted over to the other side? Let's be more passionate about our God-given right than we are about our gov-given rights. Let's be excited. Let's be enthusiastic that we get to be a child of God. Turn to someone next to you and say, you've got a right to be a child of God. And about half of you said it with a smile. Half of you were like, you've got a right to eat broccoli. <laughs> Right? Try it again with some enthusiasm. Tell someone new, you've got a right to be a child of God. <laughs> I love it. Some of you are just, I'm not saying it. You can't make me. I've got free speech. <laughs> I've got a right to not say it if I don't want to. Right? So we're going we're gonna to have a baptism now. Let's celebrate those who are God's children, because that's what we're doing today. We're going to celebrate the people that are saying, I'm God's child. I want to be fully immersed in all that he is. And uh, Jared's going to come up and lead us in a, in a transition song. And this is the time for those that are getting baptized to, to go put your trunks on. And uh, as he leads us, before he gets in the song, I want to pray. And in a minute, I want to give you an opportunity. If you, maybe you're sitting here realizing that I've gone to church a long time but I never really understood my God-given right to be a child of God. I've never really believed in the way that the Bible says to believe. I've never wanted to bring my life into the light. Or maybe you've never really received all that Jesus really is. It's just been this intellectual uh, agreement with a set of truths, but without really receiving the reality of Jesus into your life. And as a result, it's not having a real impact on your life, right? You can't bring Jesus into your life really and not have it impact you really. And maybe you prayed a prayer sometime, but there has been no discernible change in your life. You're still struggling with the same old stuff you've always struggled with. There's been no healing, there's been no sanctification, and there is no expectation of him coming again. And maybe you've, you've always thought you were on the narrow road. And maybe you realize today, wow, if I'm honest with myself, the broad road describes me pretty accurately. I'm in the dark, truth's relative. I don't want the light. I'm doing evil stuff. I'm living for myself, I'm not living to glorify God. I haven't really embraced who he is. I've just thought about some truths about who he is. My whole life isn't oriented around 
who Jesus is. So if that's you and, and there's a conviction that's going on, the Holy Spirit's tugging on places deep in your heart, and you're not sure, I want to give you an opportunity today to get sure, to choose the right lane, to confess your sin to God, and to receive Him as your Savior, as your healer, as your sanctifier, and as your coming King. So let's all bow our hearts. And if this is you and you want to get, you need to switch lanes and get in God's lane. Then in the quietness and confidence of your own heart before God, I want to encourage you to pray this prayer. And it's not the, it's not the words of the prayer that save you. I don't want to create that impression. It's your genuine desire to know God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And your willingness to receive the reality of who He is and to give your whole life to Him, that's what makes you a child of God. So if that's you today and you want to become a a child of God, you want to take your one God-given right with all you've got today and pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me. I confess that I need forgiveness for all my sin. Please cleanse my heart. Please make me your child. I receive you fully into my life. Would you heal all my brokenness today? Would you begin to sanctify my life? Bring it all into the light today, finally. I'm not holding anything back I'm not keeping anything in the dark. Would you give me an excitement for your return? Because now I know that it's a welcome home. If you prayed that prayer where every head is bowed, eyes still closed... I want to pray for you. I want you to have the opportunity to acknowledge that you made that heart decision. Maybe even as a church goer. You just raise your hand so I can pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? All right, Father, thank God bless you. Father, you've seen these hands, you know their hearts, and I pray, God, that you would fill them with such joy right now. Take away all the shame, all the guilt, all the hiding, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit, that you would cause an explosion of life to occur inside of them today that they would see a transformation beginning to happen by the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, you're so good. You love them. You're a good, compassionate, loving, relational, sacrificial, humble God that wants them to know you. And I pray that you would draw them close. Give them a real sense of your presence today. Father, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen.